decisions to be made, places to be reached, sometimes more than one at the same time. We pick up the pace, we feel the strain, we search for a solution. Sometimes the best answers to new questions are timeless. Ayurved is part of that uh, larger search for some other kind of an answer. There's an openness to go back and look at some answers from India's past. The challenge is to make up for the neglect suffered over the last uh, three, four hundred years. To make Ayurvedic medicine more relevant, you have to demonstrate it in a scientific way that works. There is a possibility of a real revolution happening in the way we practice medicine. Modern medicine has found cures for diseases that were earlier untreatable. New drugs, procedures and diagnostic aids help fight disease ever more successfully. The allopathic system of medicine identifies symptoms and treats them to combat infection. There is also an ancient system of medicine called Ayurveda that approaches treatment of disease from a different perspective. At its very core is the thought that symptoms are just clues to an imbalance in the body. They are not the disease, treat the imbalance and the disease will disappear. Ayurveda is one of the world's oldest systems of medicine. It originated in India over 3000 years ago and was passed down mostly through the oral tradition. The earliest written references to Ayurveda are found in Charak Samhita, Shushrut Samhita and Ashtanga Hridaya. The breadth and depth of these treaties is incredible. The Charak Samhita itself is a collection of eight books, most of them dating back over 2000 years. Invasions, colonial rule and the advent of Western medicine of that time marginalized Ayurveda, but it never disappeared. The formulation that most Indians instantly associate with Ayurveda is Chavan Prash. It is considered one of Ayurveda's ultimate tonics or rasayans and an all-round elixir for youth, vitality and immunity. Ayurveda is something that builds me from within. I mean, if you look at Dabar, you know, Chavan Prash is being the kind of archetypal offering in that kind of space, which is the fact that it builds your immunity. The first mention of Chavan Prash is found in the Charak Samhita. Legend has it that Rishi Chavan was to be married to the young princess Sukanya. Fearing that his advanced age and frail body would drive her away, he sought the intervention of celestial physicians who gave him a tonic that not only bestowed him with longevity, but also vitality and youthfulness. Right from 2000 BC, we have uh, the information available on Chavan Prash. And at later times, Chavan Prash has been fortified in different texts. The recipe of Chavan Prash dates back a couple of thousand years, but it was only as recently as 1949 when its formulation was standardized by one Indian company who started manufacturing it on an industrial scale. Dabur is arguably the world's largest company in the scientific Ayurveda industry. The secret to their success seems to be an early recognition of the importance of standardization. Chavan Prash uh, has been traditionally manufactured in a very archaic way, largely by hand. And, uh, and, and the processes were not very good. The composition of the product used to vary across batches. We have completely recalibrated the whole manufacturing process for Chavan Prash to make it completely automated so that there's no variation across batch. Chavan Prash is made like any other modern food product. In Dabur's version of the Chavan Prash, 47 different medicinal plants are combined with other ingredients, many of them rare herbs. These are procured from a number of sources. To make sure that the herbs and medicinal plants are of the highest quality, a series of tests are run to ensure their purity. Toxicology studies are carried out to screen out toxins and contaminants. The active elements that give the plant its medicinal properties are also carefully measured. 
For a single day's production at the Chavantrash factory at Baddi in Himachal Pradesh, hundreds of kilograms of dry herbs like ashwagandha, agnimont, mushtak, gabarchal, and draksh are tested, then ground into a fine powder and blended together. Separately, over 50 kilograms of vitamin C rich amla and other ingredients are combined with clarified butter or ghee. This creates a thick, jam like consistency. Finally, into this goes 130 kilograms of honey and the powdered dry herbs. The entire process of mixing and blending is mechanized to ensure even consistency batch after batch. Throughout the manufacturing process, spot checks are done at various stages. Once the Chavantrash is ready to be bottled, the plastic jars are run through metal detectors to ensure nothing foreign gets into this jar of goodness. The production line runs around the clock and produces over 144,000 kilograms of Chavantrash every day. That's more than the weight of two and a half thousand men. As the filled bottles make their way to the packing station, random samples are picked up from the assembly line and tested for hygiene. Chavantrash accounts for over 70% of all Ayurvedic products. Its distinctive sweet and sour taste with the occasional herby crunch is considered a tonic for good digestion, a strong respiratory system and heart, and for its anti-aging and immunity boosting qualities. The product has been able to stand up to the scrutiny of not just clinical studies, but also the trust it enjoys of millions of consumers. We have done a lot of uh, innovation with Chavan Parash so that it keeps relevant with today's consumer. We have brought in a lot of flavors like uh, mango, orange, mixed fruit, and today we have a chocolate chavan prash also. Then we also adapted it to this uh, big need of uh, sugar-free. There's a sugar-free chavan prash also by the name Dava Chavan Prakash. Creating a modern Ayurvedic product isn't just about what is done in the factory. Since Ayurveda is a plant-based medicinal system, Dabur's efforts to blend science with Ayurveda needed to extend beyond the factory to the fields from where medicinal plants are sourced. The company's R&D laboratories infuse every step of the process with science. How does a company obsessed with standardizing Ayurvedic products ensure their consistency and quality? How do they retain the essence of the Ayurvedic formulation in a modern industrial setting? First written records of Ayurveda date back more than 2,000 years. Since then, scientific research has led to a vastly expanded knowledge of the human body. Recreating the ancient medicinal formulations of Ayurveda within the context of contemporary scientific protocols at an industrial scale presents a real challenge. To reinterpret ancient texts, one must first understand the basis of Ayurveda. Medical experts in ancient India believed the human body was made of five elements or Panch Mahabhut. Bhumi or earth, Jal or water, Agni or fire, Vayu or air, and Akash or ether. These five elements were set to form the structural components of the body. One's health status was determined by the proportion of each of these elements in the body. This proportion was termed dosh and this refers to a person's unique constitution or prakriti. According to this theory, there are three types of dosh, kaf, vat and pitta. A kaf person's constitution is made up of water and earth. A vat person has a predominance of air and ether. And a pitta person of fire and water. Scientists today have reinterpreted these texts in the context of what modern science has taught us about the human body. So, what is a neurological factor? Pit is a hormonal or a endocrine function. Cuff is an exocrine function, the secretory function. We don't have anything different in even modern physiology. 
जब किसी भी शरीर में चाहे वो स्ट्रक्चरल कंपोनेंट हमारा कम हो जाता है या बढ़ जाता है या हमारा जो फंक्शनल फोर्सेज हैं वो कम हो जाती हैं या बढ़ जाती हैं तो उनको आहार के माध्यम से या लाइफ के माध्यम से या हमारी जो क्योरिंग हर्ब्स हैं उनके माध्यम से उन गुणों को हम मैच करके बॉडी में एक फिर से हारमोनी की कंडीशन पैदा करके हम बॉडी को जो है स्वस्थ बना देते हैं The theory of Ayurveda differs from allopathic medicine in one basic aspect how each views disease and its symptoms It is then interesting that in 1884 it was a 28 year old allopathic doctor who saw the benefits of this ancient Indian system of medicine He started something that revolutionized Ayurveda not just in India but across the world Dr S K Burman had a roaring practice in Calcutta He would see scores of patients each day, but much to his dismay, many of them could barely afford the expensive imported Western medicines he would prescribe. He not only, you know, rendered his services for no charge, but he actually used to leave a little bit of money under the fellow's bed or under his pillow to make sure that at least he got a decent meal and recovered that way. But Dr. Barman still grappled with the larger question: How was he to treat people if they couldn't afford the medicines he prescribed? His search for an answer led him to Ayurveda. He began reading through ancient medical literature and created herb-based remedies to treat his patients. Soon, his medicinal products were given a name that was derived from his own. If you write doctor in English, you write you abbreviate it as DR. Yeah. If you write doctor in Hindi, you abbreviate it as D A or D A. Yeah. That's where the Da came from. Doctor. Yeah. Da. Bur is short for Burman. So Da Bur. D A B U R. Doctor Burman. In time, his practice and acclaim grew, and he realized the need to create standardized Ayurvedic formulations. Da Bur was born to meet that end. Without knowing it then. Dr Barman had set himself firmly on a path that would lead to the creation of arguably the world's largest manufacturer of standardized and scientific ayurvedic remedies. Dr SK Barman's early training as an allopathic doctor hardwired the scientific approach into the DNA of Dabur. The first lab was set up as early as 1919. This became the key factor in Dabur's growth and credibility. Over the next few decades, people adopted Ayurveda in greater numbers, mostly on the back of Dabur's trust with its customers. This had an unintended consequence, one that threatened Dabur's continued growth. As a plant-based system, Ayurveda's sustainability is dependent upon an uninterrupted supply of medicinal plants. The growth of Ayurveda was making it more and more difficult to source them in sufficient quantities and of optimum quality. Many Ayurvedic plants are found in inaccessible high altitude areas. Some are even on the verge of extinction. There is also the challenge of sourcing them from areas free of earth, air and water contamination. Eighty five percent of these plants are grown in the wild. And with the spread of urbanization and increasing demand from all sectors, in ayurveda and at the herbal sector these plants are under stress the ministry of ayush in india works with practitioners and product manufacturers to systemize both the theory and practice of ayurveda part of its job is to build ayurveda's credibility and ensure its sustainability dabur turned to science once again to find a solution it set up two state of the art greenhouses fitted with systems that control temperature, humidity, airflow and maintain the optimum conditions required to grow these rare and delicate medicinal plants. Grown with care, these plants are richer in medicinal properties and provide a higher yield of consistent quality. This is crucial to the manufacturing process. To make this exercise sustainable, Dabur provides these healthy saplings to farmers. Thus, ensuring a regular high quality supply of raw material. we have a buyback system from them at a predetermined price at a predetermined return to the farmers for that product and now we are getting products of consistent quality 
consistent availability, and absolutely the right product that we want all the time. For some endangered plant species, even this isn't enough. Their survival itself is under grave threat. Some of the plants that were getting, you know, endangered, which are on the CITES list, yeah, we actually took these plants, tissue cultured them for propagation, yeah, and, and then started growing them. Ensuring the survival of these endangered plants is a painstaking process. Dabur's investment in modern laboratories are at the forefront of its efforts to save important plants from extinction. The labs develop the tissue culture in a sterile environment. Its growth carefully monitored for over two years. For some species, the waiting period can be as much as nine years. Once the plants sprout roots and leaves, they are sent to the greenhouses for further propagation. To establish the link with uh, the ancient context, we are regularly conducting the DNA fingerprinting for these plants. To ensure the correct Ayurvedic formulations, plants mentioned in the ancient texts also need to be correlated to today's context. The only way to do this is to study the available species at a molecular level. Such analysis has an immediate impact on the efficacy of the formulations. For instance, the Ayurvedic herb Kutki or Picoriza Kuroa is known to be an effective nerve tonic. According to old documents, it used to grow in the Himalayan region. DNA analysis has revealed that another variety of Picoriza Kuroa can still be found growing at over 12,000 feet at a place called Tunganath in the state of Uttarakhand. Name any kind of rare medicinal herb. We have the technology with us, either micropropagation or macropropagation, and uh, we are going to generate the kind of uh, germplasm bank required for the medicinal plant cultivation. These pioneering efforts have provided the planet with a wealth of botanical germplasm that would otherwise have been lost forever. The challenge of ensuring an uninterrupted supply of high quality raw material was met by Dabur through the use of science and cutting-edge technology. It put the same attention to detail into laying down the most exacting norms of quality and consistency. But how did the company replicate the Ayurvedic recipes written down thousands of years ago in a modern factory environment without compromising on the essence of the formulation? How does it standardize its products to ensure consistent quality reaches thousands of stores around the country? It's just another morning at the Dabur factory. Employees are hard at work using rigorously modern processes on a system of medicine that's thousands of years old. Decades of research has made it possible to move from small batch production to large-scale standardization, making the products relevant to even the discerning millennial consumer. The science of Ayurveda is not just preserved but replicated batch after batch and in volumes that look vastly different from what they were centuries ago. 25 years ago, uh, in the early 1990s, uh, we were a comparatively small company. I think the revenues had not even touched a thousand crores. They were more in the region of around 800. And we had a product that, a composition of around 50 products, which was really make, made up of three dominant brands. Red Tooth Powder, uh, Chavan Prash, and Amla Hair Oil. Contrast that with today, when we have a revenue of close to 10,000 crores and a huge product diversity of uh, 1,600 products. The growing popularity of Ayurveda and the consequent growth of Dabur gave the industry a push towards large-scale production to meet growing demand. The millions of consumers expected not just the most exacting standards of quality and efficacy, but also consistent flavor and texture. Each batch of products that reaches stores around the country had to be identical. Modern manufacturing is founded on the bedrock of standardization. 
It's a process of complying with exacting norms and standards so that batch after batch remains constant. The Ayurvedic formulations depend on rare plants as raw material. These can differ greatly in quality and efficacy. Norms have been laid down by the government in the Ayurved Pharmacopoeia of India, a detailed documentation of Ayurvedic plants and the way they should be used. We are working very closely with the Ayurvedic industry on two different counts. One is, of course, coming up modernizing and coming out with the pharmacopoeia monographs. The pharmacopoeia monograph gives the details of how to select the correct plants, the ingredients, how to manufacture a particular thing, the whole process. Large number of monographs have already been prepared, but they need to be updated on a regular basis. So on this, we are working very closely with the industry. And second is on enforcement of quality control. So we are working with the state governments, with the Ayurvedic manufacturers to make their quality control more strict and um, contemporary. In any manufacturing process, the real challenge and the tough part for a manufacturer is how to upscale from a very small, tiny 1 kg or a 2 kg batch made in a laboratory condition going up to maybe a 1000 kilos or 2000 kilos in a factory environment and yet ensuring that all the essential deliverables from that small batch or small product continue to be there even in the bigger one. It all begins by identifying a market gap. Consumer insights are collected and analyzed. The company then arrives at a need that even its consumers aren't yet aware of. We were the pioneers to bring in Ayurveda in a cough syrup market. Whereas it was uh, always perceived that uh, the allopathic products are fast acting, but there were certain um, negatives attached to that, which was like they cause drowsiness and other things. And therefore we picked on that insight. Could Ayurveda come up with a better solution? The R&D team at Dabur delved into ancient texts once again to find an answer. We found ancient literature suggests honey as a recipe. Then we evaluate the selected formulation on the basis of the grantha, on the basis of the scientific literature. We then make the standard formulation. Ayurvedic texts revealed that certain herbs had medicinal properties that could soothe the sore throat. Tulsi and Sunti are anti tussives and help in suppressing cough. Mulethi is a sore throat reliever and Banapsha an expectorant. After having found clues in ancient texts, the R&D team got to work. The challenge was to develop a formulation with all these herbs in the correct proportions to create an effective natural cough syrup. The team decided to use honey as the key active ingredient and the base of the new cough syrup. Honey is easily available, but would have to be sourced from a number of different sources. Dabur put in place a testing mechanism to check its origin and quality for adulteration and the presence of trace amounts of antibiotics. Today, the testing laboratory also identifies flowers from which the nectar was collected by honey bees. This is determined by studying the pollen count in the sample under a microscope. With the quality of all the ingredients tested, the manufacturing team got to work to create the most effective formulation for the cough syrup. This was then tested at the chemical level and evaluated for safety. Before the launch of the product, tests were conducted in the laboratory and on living organisms to establish how the formulation affects the body. The product was then taken to clinical trials. We do everything from preclinical studies, that means the toxicity of products. We have several models on, on uh, which we try the medicine. And based on that, we actually take the product into clinical trials and, and uh, do the clinical trials and demonstrate the product's efficacy before we actually put them out into the market. Once all testing and certification was complete, it was up to the operations team to take the product out of the lab batch size of a few kilos and increase the scale to metric tons. We believe that Ayurveda is a very ancient science and Dabur lays a lot of emphasis on this science of Ayurveda. 
So we need to make sure that this essence of science of Ayurveda is something that is captured in all of Dabur's products as well. We decide the technology, we decide the equipment, we decide the test procedures, we decide the control parameters, we decide the uh, method in which this is produced and how the final product is going to be tested. The company decided to be a forerunner for the industry and built state-of-the-art laboratories in factories. These laboratories are equipped with, uh, again, latest cutting-edge instruments which are supposed to check things like moisture, bulk density, specific gravity. We also do gas chromatography. We also have uh, various other, de uh, what I would call as, very complex equipment and instruments which test the parameters of the uh, actives in the herbs. The active components in any natural product are the elements that are good for the body. These need to also be present in just the right proportion. In our manufacturing process, we treat the herbs and the product such that the actives do not get damaged in the process of manufacturing. If we have to extract moisture, we extract moisture through normal uh, evaporative methods and not through vacuum which sucks the volatiles away. Testing at each stage of development and production is key to ensure efficacy of the product. Check the batch before it is taken up for filling into bottles or into containers. And there is a bulk testing protocol that is set and that again ensures that the product is delivering what it is supposed to deliver. 1,200 litres of honey is used in 3,000 kilograms of Daba Honeytus produced daily. Modern lifestyles and the emphasis on productivity has given rise to diseases that simply did not exist in the times that Ayurveda was born in. Can Ayurvedic texts provide a clue to solve these new age problems? And could these then be reinterpreted to fit today's context? Today's demanding lifestyles call for more urgent remedies. Ayurvedic formulations that were written about in the ancient Granths address some but not all modern concerns. Ayurvedic practitioners started to innovate new treatments for new lifestyles and the medical needs that came with them. We've always believed in blending innovation with traditions, but I think as a company we have to evolve beyond the traditional boundaries of Ayurveda into new formats which are faithful to the spirit of Ayurveda but may not be there in the traditional grunts, etc. Dabur started the process of innovation by reinventing its own well-established products to suit the convenience of modern consumers. One such product, used by thousands of families, was its tooth powder, Dabur Lal Dant Manjan. Its active ingredients were meant to strengthen teeth and gums and prevent tooth decay. Even then, the company found that its sales suddenly dropped. People found a tooth powder to be an archaic method of uh, oral hygiene and were gravitating towards toothpaste. So toothpaste was really the format of the future and uh, tooth powder of the past. So we very quickly had to rejig our entire thinking into converting the powder format into a paste format. Replication and simulation of the ancient methods and process of formulations is a real challenge and uh, today the success of Dabur is because of uh, the success in the understanding of these uh, processes and converting them into the modern formats. Dabur's Lal Dant Manjan was made out of 13 Ayurvedic ingredients including clove oil, pudina sattva, tomar beech and sunthi which was supposed to help fight germs and oral diseases. The key ingredient though was red ochre also called Geru or Gerik. Little efforts have been made by pharmacists to look at the importance of this particular element. The tooth powder used red ochre in its dried and powdered form. The challenge was to turn it into a stable paste. After studying the ancient texts, 
scientists at Jabur found a way to create a paste out of the dry gale. The dry red powder was passed through vacuum tubes along with other ingredients to be ground. Clove oil was added to the mixture and the liquid was boiled at a pre-decided temperature for a fixed period of time. As this mixture cooled, it changed into a thick smooth paste. Today, red tooth paste is five times the size of red tooth powder and is one of the biggest engines of our growth. Ayurvedic treatments aren't restricted just to formulations that need to be consumed or applied to the body. Ayurvedic massage is a huge industry around the world and is an example of India's soft power. The methodology places a great deal of emphasis on the body's pressure points and how they are to be stimulated. This is said to boost the body's strength and immunity and also cure symptoms of many diseases. With this in mind, Dabur decided to venture into the market's need gap once again and provide a safe and tested massage oil. Consumer Insight told them that massage for infants was culturally popular in India. The formulations used for massage though were either chemical in nature or untested natural products used at home. The company's researchers once again got to work to create a new product, this time especially for infants. Ayurveda gave them the ingredients. The new oil being created used sesame seed extract as the base. Ancient texts stated that this relaxed the body and improved sleep quality. Urat was used as a muscle tonic, camphor to increase circulation, shank pushpi to strengthen organs, and ratanjot to protect an infant's delicate skin. The exacting process of making each 3,000 liter batch of oil involves grinding, boiling, sieving, and bottling of the herb mix. The distinctive red-colored massage oil was given the easy-to-remember name, Lal Te. With three batches of oil being made every day, 9,000 liters of Dabar Lal Te are produced daily. Innovations such as the massage oil and the toothpaste, created from traditional Ayurvedic formulations, have ensured that Ayurveda remains relevant even in the 21st century. But can Ayurveda find a place in hospitals that specialize in modern medicine? Alternative forms of medicine, like Ayurveda, have shared an uneasy relationship with the modern science of allopathy. However, with increasing research in Ayurveda, there is a growing realization that multiple branches of medicine can coexist. The challenge before most of these systems of medicine, which comprise Ayush, is the kind of to make up for the neglect which they have suffered over the last three, four hundred years and uh, to bring them back into the mainstream in terms of acceptability among the people and also in terms of putting the systems back on track in terms of uh, aligning them with the modern, uh, with the expectations of people today. Hospitals are, are saying that, you know, if we are not about disease, uh, but we are about the patient, we are not about the ailment and it's a shift in perspective from being disease focused to being patient focused. This is leading to a breakdown of barriers between various branches of medicine. A small but growing number of hospitals are realizing that alternative forms of treatment can fill the gaps that aren't addressed by modern medicine. Modern medicine, which is actually quite advanced, has reached a stage where many of the uh, diseases can be controlled or research going on and all that. But there is one fundamental thing. There are approaches that if the body has a disease, we shall cure it. And the three main things we do to cure it is to either give poisons, like antibiotics or chemotherapy and things like that, or we will do surgery and cut it out. Or third, we will give it, find the most powerful radiation beam and try to kill it with the radiation. What it means is that we say the body has a disease, it has no function in trying to treat the, or cure the disease, 
it is we who will treat it but we do it with a very invasive manner efficient successful very invasive and very expensive that's the tenet of modern medicine so parking that for a moment you go to ayurveda or other traditional medicines so their tenet is that look the body has disease let us try find ways and means of boosting the immunity of the body to actually fight the disease so if the two approaches are like from the inside out of the body which is ayurveda outside in of the body which is modern medicine there is a clear possibility that we can revolutionize our approach to disease by recognizing the strengths of both this can go a long way in improving the patient's quality of life especially in managing side effects of allopathic drugs given to treat diseases like cancer people who get cancer in the mouth or in the upper airway they are given radiation to treat it people get blisters in their mouth they can't eat they get miserable they lose weight so simple concoction made with herbal medicine and honey to pre treat the patient before radiation and we have found that they don't get blisters they continue to eat they don't lose weight they don't feel the pain the misery is gone classic meets modern in this reinterpretation of holistic treatment for the patient this balance is at the core of ayurvedic theory the recovery from stroke with ayurvedic therapies like massages and you know stimulation therapies and all that the recovery becomes at least twice the speed so we are now in our place using ayurveda regularly in people with neurological injuries there is areas which we can combine the two therapies and produce much better results much less trauma to the body so i have turned into a total believer some of these systems ayurveda yoga they work in a very holistic manner unlike uh, allopathy where depending on the system a specific medicine can be given and the person gets cured ayurveda looks at uh, looks at a patient in a very holistic manner so for the same kind of uh, external symptoms different people may get different may be prescribed different kinds of treatment the ayurvedic industry is also making forays into what have become the most endemic forms of ailment lifestyle diseases like diabetes hypertension and heart disease among others even modern medicine says today that you have to modify your lifestyle to keep away lifestyle the so called lifestyle diseases now this is medicine in the 1990s and 2000 saying this ayurveda has been saying this for the last 3 and a half thousand years researchers are studying remedies prescribed by ayurveda to ascertain their impact on managing lifestyle diseases it's not that stress wasn't around so many years ago the sources of stress were different but stress was always there what the uh, population used at that time to control that level of stress yeah is what we have introduced again today in a very modern form and we have demonstrated that it works so can you avoid stress uh, yeah there are ways but uh, it can't be totally avoided but can you manage it better ayurveda has an answer for it ashwagandha uh, extract is one beautiful example and how we uh, created stress com was it's a pure ashwagandha extract extracted in a very very patent and proprietary manner in oil and uh, we have created a product called stress com which beautifully works on your stress management and reduces your levels of stress and that is clinically proven evidence backed and does very well with the uh, today's uh, doctors ashwagandha or indian ginseng is a natural substance that helps the body cope with daily stress it is also used as a general tonic and is believed to be an effective cure for anxiety and insomnia the basic difference between modern medicine and ayurveda 
is that this ancient system of medicine believes in changing the things one consumes and the way in which one leads life to prevent the occurrence of disease. Once disease sets in, patients often turn to modern medicine to find a cure. There is a possibility of a real revolution happening in the way we practice medicine, where I believe that the strengths of Ayurveda and the strengths of modern medicine can be fused together into another form of medicine. You call it new era medicine, which will emerge out of India and change the scenario in which we practice medicine for the benefit of mankind. Ayurvedic medicine is not just about popping a pill. It's about taking certain medicines along with a change in lifestyle. Ayurvedic medicine is the entire gamut of your existence. In this emerging era, Darbar's innovative R&D labs have studied the benefits of plants called Arjuna and Google. They found that an extract from Arjuna's bark had properties that lowered blood pressure, pulse rate and cholesterol. Added to this were extracts of Google, which were seen to lower cholesterol and triglycerides, while also helping in weight loss. The resulting medicine was Lippy Stack, an Ayurvedic formulation that helps in controlling cholesterol and heart disease. The medicine hints at the future of healthcare, one where an ancient practice of medicine is infused with the rigor of modern science to provide society with truly holistic care for generations to come. For Ayurved to grow and to become, you know, a, a really uh, a trusted system of medicine, it will need uh, to standardize itself in some form. It will need to have standards of certification, of scholarship, and to have a system of practice. We really have to do scientific evolution of products, get into new uh, areas of, uh, of Ayurvedic healthcare which have not been uh, dis discovered in the texts. So basically to evolve the whole science of Ayurveda into the new generation, into the new millennium, will require a lot of infrastructure in terms of science, in terms of practitioners, in terms of the whole go-to-market strategy. But uh, somebody has to do it and we believe we'll be at the forefront of that. And I think we've just seen the beginning. I think Ayurveda is going to become much bigger much more dominant as a, uh, not just as an alternative system, but also as a prime system. But of course, we need to do much more work uh, to get that uh, on the ground. An ancient science improves itself by adding scientific viability. Modern medicine finds cures hidden in centuries old texts. Ayurveda regains its presence in people's lives. Companies like Dabur restore our faith in natural remedies by combining it with cutting-edge scientific research. The Ayurvedic principle of interconnectedness comes full circle.